Are we all here practically? Or? Uh, Laura Brancato is an attorney. She works for a big company with like 13 names in the title. The first one is Meltzer. Meltzer, okay. And her real job as in there is to take care of, I guess, complicated trust situations and family organization, though she has a sordid past as a, um, a district attorney in the Bronx, but she's from Queens, <laughs> but she has family connections in Queens and all the other places. And, and very interesting, if you're there, Catherine, is your mother grew up in Argentina or? Born here. Mm -hmm. So, five or six years, and then came so maybe she was a neighbor of Catherine, Dr. Doherty, who was <laughs> behind the screen. Um, so Laura has been of enormous help to many families, and she's also helped, I think, save people's lives. And I think that's really important. And it's one of the questions that keeps coming up is, you know, how do you, to negotiate a complicated legal system in a country where we have all kinds of constitutional rights that sometimes seem to interfere with what we think some of us think is best. And it, it sets up these interesting and sometimes uh, almost un unsolvable problems, I guess, at times. So Laura's going to help us understand. So you got that, and I'll turn this off. So happy to be here, and it's been really lovely to get to know everybody over the last few days. Um, so the title of the presentation is Families in the Double Bind, and what we mean by that is simply that you're often between a rock and a hard place. If you need to use the legal system for any reason during psychiatric emergencies or step-down treatment, you'll often find, as many of you have already told me over the last few days, that it's a very difficult road to navigate. And there are many reasons why that's true, and we'll talk about some of them. But the focus of the presentation in order to make it useful is really how to stay out of the legal system. Because ultimately, if you stay out of the legal system, you have much more control over the outcome. Anytime you end up in the courtroom, you're turning over control to a third party, who I guarantee you has no psychiatric background. So the court system, unfortunately, as you can imagine, um, if you are a judge and you get assigned to the mental health part, you are dismayed at that assignment and you're looking to get out as quickly as you can. So the average tenure of a Supreme Court judge in New York in the mental health part is less than a year. So by the time you figure out how to do it, you move on to a more plum assignment as a matrimonial judge or a commercial judge or an appellate division judge, and then they bring in the next new person behind you who will spend seven months learning it, five months perfecting it, and then move on to the next job. So my role in the courtroom is usually that of an educator for the judge, which is an unfortunate but somewhat privileged position. We'll talk about that. Oh, I keep forgetting I've got to go here. Okay. So quick agenda. We'll talk a little bit about my background and why that matters, mental health and the law. We'll touch on ancient Rome for a minute because we should, because we're here. Um, talking about taking the new approach, supportive planning, and then we will touch on the legal interventions. It's purposefully last because the statute requires it to be last. If you read the Article 9 statute, if you read the guardianship statute, not just in New York, but most every state, there's actually language that says, you have to come here as a last resort. You actually have to show, if you do it correctly, that you have tried everything else in order to be successful. So I put it last so we can talk about, if you can't do any of the eight things before that, how you end up in that scenario. Okay, so who I am and why it matters. So I grew up in Queens and then suburban Long Island. I went to Catholic high school and to Jesuit college at Loyola, what is now Loyola University in Baltimore. And my second weekend at school, um, there was a community service project that you have to participate in your freshman year of college. And I was handed a flyer about homelessness outreach. You could sleep outside with the homeless in Fells Point. And I promptly called my dad and said, this is what I was going to do. He said, I will 
bring you home immediately. Do not sleep outside. I slept outside. So, and that really started, I'd grown up really mostly in the suburbs. I'd never been to a big city and I fell in love with Baltimore. And for those of you who know anything about Baltimore, you know, it's historically a city that struggled with homelessness, poverty, drugs, mental health, and the criminal justice system, of course. So for the four years of college, I worked on homelessness initiatives. I tutored at the local jail, worked in the infectious disease unit. A lot of things my parents thought were useless, but I found super interesting. And so when I left uh, college, I went to law school and I purposely chose St. John's because it had a strong public interest program. And very quickly, I knew I wanted to work at the district attorney's office. So I left school. I had a choice of DAs. Everybody told me, do not go to the Bronx. So I promptly went to the Bronx. <laughs> I'm not a person who takes direction very well. Um, and I did that because it was a place nobody else wanted to go. And it was obvious to me on day one why nobody wanted to go there. There were no resources. My parents used to give me office supplies as birthday and Christmas presents. We literally had no paper. If I wrote a homicide motion, I wrote it on the back of somebody's scrap paper. We had no paper clips. And I graduated law school in 2003. We're not talking about forever ago. We're talking in recent time. And I loved it. And it was an amazing experience. And I spent a lot of time in the mental health court. I spent a lot of time in the domestic violence unit. And I ultimately completed my career in the homicide and gang unit where I worked a lot with families in crisis. And that job was, as you can imagine, somewhat overwhelming. So when I had my first child, I took some time off. And as life has it, I think Irene was saying this before, it kind of sends you in a different direction. I had all intention of going back to that world. And then my son Tate was born. And he was born unexpectedly with a genetic condition known as 22Q11 deletion, velocardiofacial syndrome. And so it started me on this on very unexpected journey of advocate parent and ultimately medical decision maker. He was a very complex birth, very complex medical profile. And kids with 22Q11 deletions have a much higher incidence of developing mental health over the course of their lifetime. So I decided that when I went back to work seven years later, that I would devote my career in a different direction. So I'm somewhat here on the earlier side. I may end up being much like the parents in this room. It's likely based on Tate's profile at this point. But I've been advocating for him as a parent and as an attorney since the day he was born. So I intimately understand from a parent perspective and also as an advocate how important these types of opportunities are educationally, legally, and I can see for my clients from both perspectives how these scenarios play out and how difficult it can be to get the good advice that you need. So the starting point here is to understand that the complex legal system completely fails to adapt to the changing environment of mental health. It is not at all flexible. The statutes are rarely amended. And even if they are, they don't reflect what people actually see. We all know that you remember how a bill becomes a law from you know, grade school or middle school. There's a lot of negotiation and how statutes come to be passed. They rarely reflect at the end the issue that they're meant to address because they are the production of a political process. We also have an extreme lack of qualified attorneys to really guide families in the mental health field. If you Google mental health lawyer in New York, you'll return three names. I'll be one of them. There'll be a few other female lawyers, but most law firms don't even advertise if they do mental health work because it has a stigma attached to it that I think many of you may have experienced already in your personal lives. And quite literally, the presentation is done purposefully on black and white slides because the law is very black and white. There are very few areas of gray. So I'm going to guide you in the gray area so you stay out of the black and white area because when you're sick, the legal system is the last place you're going to find good solutions. So we want to stay out of the black and white discharge, don't discharge scenario. We want to stay out of the black and white forced court intervention. 
because those solutions are not flexible enough. So we were gonna move out of the black and white into more of a gray space. Okay, so quickly, interesting to know that in ancient Rome, some of the medical writings, the earliest medical writings come out of Rome and they talk about mental illness, um, primarily using words and language from the Greeks, but it was thought to be caused uh, by divine punishment or dem demonic spirits or curses. And early medical writers observed patients probably with what today we would characterize as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Um, and they, would, they were called or described as anxieties or mood disorders. And some of the treatment for mental illness was rather barbaric, bloodletting, leeching. Um, Celsus, who lived at the time when this temple down the street was built, was one of the first medical writers. And he talked about um, you know, treating patients either in a dark room or a light room. It's a very interesting, if you ever need something to put yourself to sleep. Um, he treated people he thought were socially acceptable with bright rooms and people who couldn't be dealt with in dark rooms. And he thought he was very successful, but I think his success rate was rather low. Um, so he was also known to be a staunch supporter of torture um, it, as a form of men mental health treatment. So why do I bring that up? It is sad to say that in common times, we have not moved so far from this scenario. And I'm here to tell you that even as an advocate in this world, and as somebody who spends a lot of time working in Albany with the state government, that the perspective shifting isn't happening as much as we would think if we watch the news. So part of my role at the law firm is with private clients. I spend probably 75% of my time with private clients in and out of the courtroom, depending on their need. Of that 75%, well more than half are mental health. The others are individuals with cognitive impairments, traumatic brain injuries, um, you know, park, advancing Parkinson's, ALS, dementias, Alzheimer's. So there's that portion of it. But the vast majority of my time outside of that private client setting is working with the New York State court system. So I pro bono am appointed by the state on guardianship cases or litigation cases involving mentally, what the law declines, just defines as a mentally incompetent person. And so in that role appointed by judges and Supreme Courts from all five boroughs of New York City, up to Westchester where I live, um, Nassau and Suffolk County, really all the way up to Albany County. I work with families who are in the legal system because somebody told them that this was the way to get treatment for their child or their loved one. And what we find is the outcomes are poor, the judges don't understand. So they appoint me and my team um, as a last resort because the guardianship system, as we'll talk about, is totally inept to deal with mental health. So they're usually in the wrong place for the wrong reason and we're trying to guide them back. But in doing that, I also take that knowledge and work with the governor's office. I'm appointed by the state bar on two task forces one that deals with homelessness and interaction with the legal system, and the other that's called mental health and trauma impacted representation. So I work with the governor's office on guiding policy, but I will tell you that I could say the same thing 50 times. And on the 51st time, somebody will say, what did you say last time? And we will go through the process over and over again. So though I'm proud to say in the time I've been working with this group that a lot more funding this budget year was very generous mental health funding. It's not funding the right programs. It's funding, as we talked about briefly yesterday, maybe crime increase in asylum seekers in the city as a huge stress. City spent over a billion dollars last year on the influx of migrants in, in the five boroughs. So the resources are being diverted out of the programs that are being shown to be successful. So a program like Irene's or a program like Chris's might not get the funding it needs to continue at a robust pace. So how do we deal with that? The most important thing for a private client to know is that you it all starts in modernizing your approach to your long-term planning. I think Dr. Leitman said it yesterday, many of your children, the people that you love, the people you treat will need a certain level of support for life, right? We don't want that support to come from the court system. We want that support, if we're doing it correctly, to come from you. And how do we do that? 
So we need to reinvestigate our common practice. If you have a child or a loved one who has a diagnosed serious mental illness, basic or form estate planning does not work for you. It will not work for you in the long term. I spend a lot of my day informing trustees and family members and very prominent trust and estates lawyers about why the common plan simply will not work. A one size fits all approach is totally inadequate. And what I mean by that is if you have more than one child, your one size fits all estate plan will not work contemporaneously for all of those beneficiaries. It actually statistically can't. And I'll give you an insight here. It doesn't work even for neurotypical individuals either, but we've just come to produce and reproduce the same 60 page trust document over and over and over without asking the questions, who does it serve? And it doesn't serve a beneficiary that has differing needs. Planning has to include flexibility. We're gonna talk about why that might be difficult, but the common estate planning attorney is going to charge you a fortune for a document that's totally inflexible. And as we've been talking about for the last day and a half, you need flexibility. You need the ability to respond to what's happening in that year or in that month or in that week. You cannot have an inflexible plan because you have a flexible situation going on. You have, a, you have something that's not static. So why would you have a static plan? Documents need thoughtful preparation and my goodness, they need sensitive language. If I read another trust that refers to a, someone with a serious mental illness as an invalid, or it talks about punishment, or it talks about laziness, I'm sure you've all heard it. I have to bite my Italian tongue a lot of times because there will many times be conversations where a person who's unable to work because of the nature of their illness is defined as lazy or um, ungrateful or a failure to launch. If one more person says failure to launch, I'm going to launch them. So I just think that it's a, an understanding that we're, stig we're further stigmatizing the people that we love. And if you're in this room, you are here because you already understand the complex nature of the illness and know that it's not a purposeful choice not to be able to get out of bed and work a 40 hour work week. Most neurotypical people struggle to get out of bed and work a 40 hour work week. So if you have common stressors built in, it doesn't work. Special needs beneficiaries need specialized support. You cannot write in basic provisions. You have to be thoughtful about what your loved one needs. Every person needs something different. Some of the clients I work with from Dr. Murata's office need a great amount of oversight. Others need a light touch, but they all need something different. And depending on the family's resource level, where they live in the country, um, and how old they are, and who's coming in behind them, which we're going to talk about, your, your plan has to be very thoughtful. Documents cannot control behavior and neither can your bank, okay? So here's another common misconception. I see loads of trust documents that appoint a successor as a, as a financial institution, a trust company for people who have wealth. That's generationally how wealth has been managed. The bank, when your child goes into a mental health crisis, will also go into crisis. It will have no concept of how to deal with the realities of Mo many cases, just a temporary glitch, just a little bump in the road will become a meltdown. And many times the bank will refuse to act, which is the worst possible outcome when you're in the middle of an emergency. The plan needs to address deficits in executive functioning. And we'll go into executive functioning later because it's super important. We cannot plan for this beneficiary. Many clients come to me saying, I want to put Susie Smith on a budget, and I want her to understand the value of money, and I want her to learn how to save, and I want, there are 8 million executive functioning skills that go into your decision to buy or not buy an item, or to save money to buy something at the end of the week, or to plan how to get to an appointment to get your new eyeglasses. Many of our children have mine included, extreme issues with executive functioning that make the typical beneficiaries planning really difficult to achieve. It's almost you're set up to fail 
So we have to plan around those deficits. And of course, we have to include the full family. I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday that part of what works in some of these more successful programs is the involvement of the entire family. This should not be parents and a lawyer sitting in a room by themselves. This has impacted your whole family for the entirety of the length of the illness, and so does the planning. We can't do this in a vacuum. It has to be generalized so that everybody's comfortable and everybody understands what's going on. And again, litigation always as a last resort. Okay, so going to common practices need a new look. I commonly call this the transfer of love. Sitting in this room, coming to this conference, educating yourselves is an act of love. You clearly love the person that you care for or that's your child or that you advocate for. You come from a place of love. Nobody, and maybe someone has told you this, maybe they haven't, nobody is going to love or care for your child the way that you do. They can't. It's physically impossible. As a parent, now that I am a parent, a parent to a child, there is no substitute for what I will do for my child. There just isn't. So I am often explaining to clients, we have to codify your transfer of love. We have to put into place every single thing that you do that you don't even think about anymore, that you do to keep the world going for your child or your loved one or your patients. We have to codify it so that everybody else knows how to love and take care of the person that you care for. You assume that that's happening it's not. Nobody, if I asked you to sit down, and I have done this with certain clients, and list everything you do in a week to help care for your child, no matter their level of independence, you would be shocked at what you write down. You've been doing it so long, you don't even realize you're doing it. So how do we move that forward? We move that forward by broadening your circle of support. Your support system can't just be the two of you. Some of you already belong to another support system, or you work with Dr. Murata and his team at Silver Hill with Sophia, you know, to broaden your circle of support. Well, there are other ways to broaden it. Um, I know Dr. Leitman talked about NAMI. There are a lot of organizations, 501c3s, um, private organizations that you can start to build relationships with to broaden the circle of people that help support you and your loved one in a time of crisis. Because the more people around, the greater the likelihood that there will be somebody to catch a person who's having a tough time. Maintaining a team mentality and multiple disciplinary approach is kind of one and the same. We need to bring in experts in every discipline, right? So when I write a plan or when I work with a family who already has a plan, I'm advocating for a crisis team to be available if you already use one. I'm advocating for you to think about psychologists and psychiatry, obviously, but what other thing? Do we have a job coach? Do we have a wellness person? Do they like yoga? Do they like acupuncture? Whatever helps them maintain their wellness in the community is part of, those people are part of the team. Ridding ourselves of form documents or form anything. If somebody gives you a form, it reminds me very much of I'm sure many of you have been through the IEP process when you have a child with special needs. I find myself saying over and over again, the word IEP, it stands for individualized education plan. Why are you giving me the plan from the kid who was in here 20 minutes before me? He doesn't have any of the same features as Tate, right? This has to be individualized. Your trust shouldn't look like anybody else's trust because your life doesn't look like anybody else's life. So demanding a holistic approach. And when I say that, I don't mean necessarily from treatment providers. I mean from the community at large. And that includes attorneys. Attorneys also have to move with the times and recognize that beneficiaries are complex. We can no longer plug people's names into an already formed document and hit print. I actually spend a great deal of time educating the lawyers I work with who are pure estate planning attorneys about this fact that you can't stop at the question of, well, I have a son who's a spendthrift. So I need a certain kind of trust. And I say, well, what kind of spendthrift? Why is he spending money? Well, I didn't ask that question. I said, well, then how could you possibly know what to write? If he's spending overspending because he has a substance abuse disorder or he's developmentally disabled, or you, how could you write a plan? You need to demand that from everybody that's in your world. And if you remember nothing else about this discussion, 
your plan has to be tested and retested early, like now, and as frequently as necessary. Forget the days where you build a plan that takes effect after you pass away. How will you know if it works? You have to do it now. So we advocate for our clients to start using living trusts and other mechanisms, putting in advanced directives, testing them, testing who you choose. How do you develop the relationship between your loved one and a new person on the block when you can no longer be the person? How do you choose that next person? We can't wait until you die because then we can't change it. <laughs> After you passed away, it's very difficult to change your plan. It's possible if you have one of these 70 page trusts, I would hope there's a provision in there that would allow a revision, but sometimes it's hard. So we have to test the plan. We have to test it now. So what are the elements of a supportive plan from the beneficiary standpoint? And when I say beneficiary, just the legal way of saying the person you're treating, whether it's your patient, your client, your loved one. Please remember, no matter their level of disability, when a person turns 18 in New York, in other states, it's a little older, but in New York and Connecticut, it's 18. You are emancipated. You are your own person, even if you are profoundly disabled, if you're nonverbal, if you live in a nursing home on a trach, when you turn 18, you are your own man or your own woman. You are an adult in the eyes of the law. And unless and until the court rules that somebody takes charge of that person, they continue to be an adult. So we ask for the clients who can do it, and I've done this, I've actually been to Silver Hill many times to do these documents on discharge, we ask the clients to consider, can their loved ones sign traditional advanced directives? A healthcare proxy, power of attorney, maybe a HIPAA. And if we're really lucky, we'll talk about a psychiatric advanced directive. And what that does is it just gives you your foot in the door. You are not an excluded party. Now, could these documents be revoked when somebody gets ill with the exception of the psychiatric document? Yes they can be revoked. However, these documents are protection in the long run. If we end up in court, I get to show these documents to the court and say, see, when she was feeling great, she wanted her parents. And that helps to influence the court because when she's standing there saying, I effing hate my parents, they're the devil. We have evidence that when she was well, she trusted you and she wanted you, which we would think judges would automatically assume it's not true. If you have the documents, the statute mandates that the court consider them. So we want them in the worst case as evidence in the future. In the best case, we want to empower the people in our lives. That purpose that we were talking about, that meaningful existence, it's being part of that is being treated like an adult. I'm going to have this conversation with you upon discharge, not because you, you, you're leaving Silver Hill, because when you turn 18, everybody should have these documents. And I often tell clients when I do those appointments, I meet a ton of 18 year olds. In, at, when they go off to college, we often say to parents, as soon as your kid goes to college, they need advanced directives. Because guess what? Under this often used HIPAA rule, if your child is in the hospital in Virginia and you call to find out what happened, they won't tell you unless you have a healthcare proxy and a HIPAA once the person's 18. So you need it. So we want that at a baseline for a beneficiary. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on benefits determinations because that's a talk into itself, but I'll tell you that Medicaid and all of these benefits, SSI, SSDI, they do have a place. It's not only for people who are impoverished. There are certain programs in the state through OMH, the Office of Mental Health, where you need a Medicaid card to apply. For kids who have dual diagnosis, developmental disability and, and serious mental health, like my son, he needs Medicaid because there are programs under the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities that are crucial that he can't get without the Medicaid card. So especially educationally, if he's going to end up doing extended school, we need that access. Those programs are not amazing, but you still want to have the ability if you need to. Housing, outpatient treatment, long-term placement. I think I spend the vast majority of my time with Dr. Murata talking about transitional living. It's probably the biggest question that we still have to answer, especially for young people who are in their 20s. Where will they live? So when you're thinking about a supportive plan, you're focused on that. Now, executive functioning abilities, we'll get there in a second. 
probably the top issue that I deal with on a daily basis is the child or the loved one's relationship to money. Money, especially with certain serious mental illnesses, is a control issue, right? It's about independence, the pushback of being infantilized by being on a budget or being restricted by a true link card or whatever mechanisms we try to use. Money can be a very hot button topic. And so the way we handle that in the planning is we take the parent out of the equation. There is a very distinct and real effect when the parent and child stop arguing about money. When we put the parent out and we put in a bookkeeper, um, it could be as basic, I use accountants sometimes, any trusted person, you would be amazed how quickly the budget issues resolve because it's no longer about a parent telling an adult child, you can't buy a new puppy. It's about a professional saying, the budget doesn't permit a puppy this month, but maybe next month. And somehow hearing that from an independent person changes the dynamic. So these are the things we think about with the beneficiary. Now, executive functioning, we'll do two minutes on this. Executive functioning is defined in many ways, but it's goal-directed behavior and it's optimizing performance on complex cognitive tasks that allow the individual to achieve flexibility and adaptability. Now. When we talk about this purposeful, meaningful life, we're talking about a person functioning in society. Functioning independently requires a certain level of executive functioning. And there are many resources, lots and lots of people now, I feel like every day I meet someone new who's an executive functioning coach. There are resources available for people who have these significant deficits, but we can't plan in a vacuum. We have to appreciate if a beneficiary doesn't have working memory, cognitive flexibility, or response inhibition, when the trustee calls and says, you can't have money this month for your movie studio you want to open, we're going to have an explosive scenario here where the response inhibition is depleted, the cognitive flexibility doesn't exist, they're gonna shoot off an email saying, I'm gonna blow up US trust company, and now I'm in court, right? So we have to appreciate that the trust and all of the mechanisms have to build in some support here that the trustee or anyone working with the beneficiary understands that they can't, you can't mail them a budget for most of the kids and expect them to understand A to Z, a 20 point way to get access to discretionary funds. We often find, I'll say to the trustee, how did you do it? Well, we sent him our plan. You have to, you know, Step one, fill out this application. Step two, email it, scan it, and fax it. Step three, it's never gonna happen. So what are the elements of a supportive plan from the creator side? So you're the creator now, right? You're the person who's in control as the doctor, as the parent, as a social worker, as a nurse practitioner, you are directing how this is going to go. You have to start with clear goals. If you don't have clear goals, you will never get where you need to go. Remember that no one size fits all. So this may mean that you create different plans for different children. You have three children. You may write one set of trust documents for your special needs child and a separate set for your other two kids. You may set up a private trust company for your special needs child and you may use traditional estate planning for your other family members. You don't have to live and die by a form, no matter how expensive the lawyer tells you it's going to be. It's money well spent if you do it correctly because you have to have flexibility. The plan has to be flexible. And I'll just give you a second on this. A lot of estate planning attorneys and attorneys who deal with clients with affluence are focused on tax strategy. It's the business, right? If I'm not a tax attorney, thank heavens, but if I were, I would be focused on saving my clients money. Well, those types of trust instruments often by IRS mandate are inflexible. You can't change those plans, some of them. So it could be that tax planning is right for much of your asset class, but not for all of it. And you may have to accept the fact that there won't be tax savings as to a specific beneficiary because that's just what works for them not necessarily what works in the overall plan. And you have to be willing to step outside of the traditional thinking. Optimize creativity. I write trust provisions all day that are creative, that use positive life-affirming language. 
that do not refer to someone as disabled if it's at all necessary. There are some words that have to be included for IRS reasons, but other than that, we try to use very positive um, language because many of your children are brilliant. They have brilliant, brilliant minds, they have IQs that are Mensa, make the Mensa candidates, they read the documents and they internalize what the document says about them. So if they, we put a document in front of them to understand and they read negative things about themselves, they believe that you feel they can't achieve something, which I don't think anybody in this room believes. The most important thing, and we've talked about this over dinner and cocktails, who is the successor in authority? Are you just going to assume it's a sibling? Nine times out of 10, I don't use a sibling. And I think those of you who live this life may understand why. Siblings have been through it with their sister or brother. And oftentimes they are not emotionally available enough to really deal with being in charge of another sibling. It's a very strange dynamic. And when we appoint a sibling as a decision maker, we almost violate the sibling relationship because siblings should be people you go to for anything. If your sibling is now telling you you can or can't have money because yesterday you called in a crisis and now they're feeling like, oh my gosh, I can't give them. You violated the sanctity of that relationship. And siblings are wonderful. I have two younger children who will absolutely be Tate's best support system, but they will not be in charge of his resources or getting him qualified for government benefits. It's not in some, I would almost argue in some cases, it's not fair, but also it's not usually terribly effective. And there's a lot of emotion in there. So again, we try to move around that and come up with some creative solutions, avoiding derogatory, derogatory thought process and language, meaningful outcomes are the goal and set reasonable measures for success. If we have to go into budgeting or we have to set reasonable measures, you're not looking to achieve everything. Again, the documents should be revisited every four or five years. So if the success is there, you can make the benchmark a little higher the next time, if you absolutely have to. Sometimes I get forced to ask the question to my clients, does it really matter if that $500 was spent irresponsibly this week? We're gonna reset and try again next week. Is that really killing anybody? Are we going to be, you know, we're gonna set a punishment and reduce the budget to 250 next week? Not learning anything from that. On the executive functioning slide, there was a, there was a line there that says, punishment doesn't work. In these scenarios, punishment does not work. You have to find a positive way to reaffirm or reassess what's going on. So when the plan goes awry, what do we do? So first you'll call somebody like me because in a lot of ways we joke about this, but you need a fixer. You need a person who can look from the outside and say, what intervention is appropriate here? A document cannot control a person. We can make the best plan. And then your loved one goes through a period of instability and the document suddenly doesn't make sense. It doesn't work and it can't control behavior. So also, like we said earlier, neither can a financial institution. So let's take a common sense approach. I'll give you an example. I've been working with a family for very many years who uses a different trust and estates law firm, which is very common in my practice. I don't seek to come in and take over. I like to just sit on the edge and advise and advocate. So we have a client who's 41 years old and lives in New York City, and he's had a diagnosis of bipolar depressive disorders, all different kinds of serious mental illness for 25 years. He comes from a very affluent family. Now, before me, the family went to the guardianship court, got guardianship. It turned into a total nightmare. The guardian tried to take over his life. Then they filed another lawsuit to get rid of the guardian. That traumatized him further. Long story short, he was in overt psychosis at Mount Sinai inpatient unit when I met him. And my role, I was hired to really advocate for him to come in, somebody finally realized, bless you, he may need an intermediate. And so what we did was we built in a better trust administration process, but we built it in a way that unfortunately when he got rehospitalized last year, it just worked. He had, it, we had a trust that had a trigger provision in it. It restricted his access to certain money. While he was impatient, he was overtly psychotic. He fired me multiple times on the phone, which 
You can't fire someone when you're overtly psychotic. So I did keep my job. But um, when he was well and now takes the injectable Abilify and does a whole bunch of other outpatient support, the plan reverted back to the way that it was. Unfortunately, I, I called Rocky um, last month. He has a very troubled relationship with his dad and it drove him to try to take his life, unfortunately. And he ended up at New York Presbyterian last month up in Westchester by me, where I spent very many hours sitting with him. And the plan again, this time, because he was on the injectable Abilify, he was not overtly psychotic, but severely depressed. So we didn't have to trigger anything. He wasn't going to spend money. He wasn't hiring guru lawyers. He wasn't trying to get a plane ticket to India anymore. He was in the right frame of mind. He was just terribly sad and really stressed out. So I didn't have to trigger anything, but I could have in a moment if I needed to. So the plan stays as is. And what did we do? We removed the dad from the trust planning because the father-son relationship is horrendous. We've implemented some independence, including my colleague, Lori Sullivan, who's been doing this work a long time as well. So she's the independent trustee and I'm his attorney and I'll always be his attorney. So I sit in that role where when somebody tries to do something that's egregious, like failing to give him trust distributions, I advocate for him reasonably, right? To say he, he is a whole person. He's been living well for over a year. He doesn't, you're penalizing him for having a diagnosis of a mental illness. And actually the lawyer from the trust and estates group regularly calls him a bad seed. And I, in these conversations, I just have to say like you're perpetuating the problem. You're the reason he's tried to slit his wrists open because he believes he deserves less because you're telling him that, but he doesn't deserve less because he's actually a genuinely lovely person. So long-term success and moving on from short-term hiccups you need a good advocate. It could be a trust protector. It could be a lawyer. It could be a mental health um, advocate. I know we talk about Brad Richards a lot. Anybody that can be on the side of the, of the beneficiary so they don't feel alone. Flexible plans can work under the circumstances I just described, working collaboratively and striving to gain consent. So this is where Dr. Murata and the wizardry comes in, right? How do we avoid forced intervention? In my opinion, it, you have to have a great deal of patience. You have to have a great deal of flexibility and you have to be okay with failing. We talked about this, I think Sam and I, when I was at the DA's office, the DA's office in the Bronx had a conviction rate of less than 20%. So in the eight years that I was there, I learned to fail. You were basically set up to fail. I've tried very many cases. I didn't win very many, mostly because I was in an environment where nobody trusted anybody. But in any event, it, you build that character of failing is not failure unless you allow it to be. It's a learning experience as always, but it's also information. What failed and how can we make sure it doesn't fail in the future? And the, the best way to do that is to do everything you can to gain consent. But what happens if you can't? Okay, so... Again, legal interventions are state specific. I'll speak broadly because New York and Connecticut have similar um, statutes. So does Washington DC, Virginia area, similar. Um, some states are better or worse than others. At a broad stroke, we have two different competing processes. Guardianship or conservatorship, it's called in Connecticut conservatorship, are Supreme Court proceedings held in specialized parts. Don't let that make you feel good about it. The specialized part is again, a rotating judge. So in New York County, we have four courtrooms that deal with guardianships. We are blessed with four female jurists who get it and care and take the time necessary. If you get stuck in Westchester County, good luck. The male jurist and the guardianship part, there's only one, is the worst of the worst. I'll tell you this, he does guardianships some days and gun permits on other days. It's not a good, it's a very, um, and he's a good old Italian, but my goodness, is he the worst? So, I mean, it's recorded, but it's, he knows I think he's the worst. It's fine. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, he knows his name. So, um, but it is litigation. You have to appreciate before you march into this. I was saying this um, to some friends I met the other day, right? When you file the paperwork, it says your name against 
your name, right? And that gets served. Here come the constitutional rights. That person has a right to be in the courtroom and hear you testify against them. That's the way it's set up. There is no mechanism for it to be kinder or gentler. I've created one and some of the judges let me do it. Westchester, I'm not allowed to do it. But I try to make it a non-adversarial room because the adversarial nature of it creates a dynamic that we can't control. But at its core, because of the constitutional implications, your loved one is called an alleged incapacitated person and they're given an attorney. And therein starts the problem, right? Now you're losing control. Control's moving out of your hands. They have a legal advisor that we often are not even allowed to speak to who's giving them whatever the advice is. If they say they don't want a guardian, I hate my parents, they're controlling, that that person stands up in court and says so-and-so doesn't want a guardian, the parents are terrible. And herein, you're battling yourself, almost. The court will also appoint an independent investigator. Take this up to heart. Independent investigators on this court-appointed list are lawyers who generally can't get work doing anything else. So they get appointed on this list, and heaven knows what happens from there because some of them are not lawyers, some of them are not social workers, some of them are medical malpractice attorneys who don't know anything about mental health. Um, and testimony is often taken open court or virtually, we do a lot of it now. And your loved one or the litigant has the right to testify and cross-examine every single person that you put on the witness stand. And remember, once that person, whoever you call participates, is it Dr. Murata, although I would hope he wouldn't, other people might, you've now destroyed whatever working relationship you have with these individuals because the, the AIP will never trust that person again. Now, you can seek powers over property, meaning finances or person or both. In New York and Connecticut, it's a highly customizable statute. But here's the rub. Guardianship in New York specifically can do nothing for you if you have a pure mental health diagnosis. It's almost useless. Over property, potentially. But property, by the way, has to be property owned by the person. So if your child has never worked or can't work substantially and they rely on you and you hold the property, you have no property interest to take control over. If there's planning that's unfortunate and there's an inheritance that's left and the person's sitting on a million dollars that they're spending irresponsibly, yes, you might be able to take control of that property. But over their person, absolutely not. You cannot make psychiatric decisions as a guardian. You cannot force medication as a guardian. None of that happens in the guardianship statute. And of course, it mandates that you go there as a last resort. So you're in overt crisis. The process takes six months and you come out with a letter that doesn't help you. You can't make medical decisions. It's really a statute that was designed. We call it the adult guardianship part because it's really designed for the dementias and the cognitive impairments or the sudden hit by a bus and you need someone to pay your bills. It's not meant for people with complex biological issues, complex medical issues, and, and especially for young people. It's a permanent solution. When you become guardian, it's forever. So unless somebody moves to revoke it, it's a significant intrusion on your right to decide if you wanna drive or have a baby or buy a house. You need somebody else to make every single decision for you. And I don't think most of us really want, I don't want that for my son, but you know, I wanna customize how it happens. I don't want the court to tell me yes or no. Now, on the other side, we talked about AOT this morning, a little bit this afternoon. In New York and Connecticut, that's under a different statute. That's an Article 9 statute. Article 9 is where we get our forced treatment, our forced intervention, and our court oversight. Now, the reason I have them in two separate categories, no judge in the state at the current time does both guardianship and Article 9 work. I'm trying to fix that. We have a pilot program we're hoping the mean judge will let us launch next year. But because he actually is, Westchester is a very unique place and it actually could, I believe it could work there. But so if you need, let's say, property management authority, but you also want medication, you need two separate legal proceedings. And they each take a long time and they each require you versus them. So this is not a one-stop shop, and this is not a one-stop shop. Article 9 is just medication and treatment. Article 81 is your longer-term intervention. 
they don't mix, they don't sit in the same place. They're two separate processes. So under Article 9, most often we see those applications pursued by a hospital while the person is in, in treatment. Now, do we wish they were done more often? Sometimes we do. And Dr. Murata and others and I have advocated with the medical system on some of those. There is a very high standard to retain and medicate over objection, as many of you already know. You And you have to go back to court frequently to keep extending your ability. And also, if midway through treatment, you want to change up the medication protocol, you have to go back to court. You cannot, if you're on a medication order, just simply change it up. You have to keep going back. And every time you go back, so does the patient and so does the patient's lawyer. So it's a fight every time you have to revisit the discussion. Extreme resistance by most hospitals to even employ this mechanism because they don't want to lose. We often hear that they'll only go in if they're the sure thing. They don't want to bring these cases to court unless they know the judge is going to rule with them. And the judge rules with them 99% of the time. So they keep the trust by only bringing the cases that are a sure thing. The kids in the gray area who really need may need that intervention don't go there because the medical facility won't take the risk. There's an unreasonable fear by most medical facilities of a lawsuit. I, if I hear that one more time, I'm gonna get sued and I'm saying, by whom? By the person who is so overtly psychotic, he's gonna be discharged to the temple of India. He, he can't sue you, he has no money, he has no shoes. I don't even know how he would find a lawyer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sue you how? And like we talked about yesterday, there is often a completely inappropriate and inapplicable um, shielding by using the words, the language of HIPAA. HIPAA doesn't say 99% of what the hospital system says. And I write very many letters to hospital systems explaining what HIPAA actually is. That's a form, that is a form document I use. I just hit repeat, I just change the name and just print because it really is, if we're thinking about a lawsuit, we should be thinking about what happens if discharge someone inappropriately. We worked on a case last month where we were fighting to keep the person in New York Presbyterian and they kept telling me, well, he has a discharge plan. He wouldn't let anybody participate in the plan, but he was a person here without citizenship. So he has no legal status, no benefits, no place to go, no money of his own. And he'd been living in a hotel that somebody had generously provided for him. But once he got to the facility, the family was saying no more, right? The facility said, well, he says he's getting discharged to a hotel and he has money. And I said, well, here are the parents. He has neither money nor a place to go. And by the way, he's illegally overstayed his visa. So if he gets picked up, he's getting brought to JFK in a psychotic state to be put on a plane back to where he came, which is 12 hours away from here. And they discharged him anyway, because they told me they were afraid he would sue. And what I wrote in the letter is what you should be afraid of is that I will sue. Because truthfully, I mean, the HIPAA rules don't say what you say they do. And the public health law says you have an obligation not to perform a safe and inappropriate discharge. This is totally safe and totally inappropriate. So we have to like refine the conversation. Two seconds on AOT. I agree with you, Chris, on its applicability and its deterioration of consensual relationships. AOT is helpful. AOT is a supervised assisted outpatient treatment program. It has to be ordered by the court in the county in which you live. And it is oversight into medication compliance. AOT, in my opinion, the success of the program depends on where you're accessing it. In a lesser populated place like Columbia County in Hudson, I send people to Columbia County to live there because they have a magnificent AOT program. And I have very many clients who have found no stability in 50 years who are living stable lifestyles with only AOT supervision up there. Some private services, but, and you don't pay for AOT. So for families who need that and can't afford it privately, it can be a lifesaver. But downstate, it's a disaster and the teams change and you often get a very forceful application of the statute. And what I see it do is deteriorate the relationship between the family and the AOT team that we often end up in court when the family wants to challenge the team's decision-making about medical protocols or they don't like, this happens often. AOT puts in medical plan in place. The side effects of the medication are very significant and then the team is unwilling to make an adjustment. And the family who's living with those side effects is like, you have to change this, this is ruining my life. And the AOT team won't. 
So I see that friction happen frequently with families, but depending on where you're accessing it and how many people need it, it can greatly determine whether that program is successful. And of course, all of Article 9, you still have to show dangerousness. The way the statute is written, you have to show the person's overtly dangerous to themselves or to other people. It's a little easier these days because people keep getting pushed in front of the subway. If that weren't happening, we're still back in the dark ages here. But it is unfortunate side effect of the society we're living in that as people randomly get hit over the head with a hammer and it makes the front page news, it's a little easier for me to get what I need because everybody unfortunately is furthering the stereotype that everyone with a mental illness is violent. But it does, it ha has an unfortunate side effect. So I know I covered a ton of material and there are so many ins and outs that we didn't get to, but the overarching idea here is that you are in control. You are educated, you're educating yourselves on a continuing basis. I've had so many wonderful conversations. I feel so privileged to be a part of this conference or colloquium or whatever we're calling it, symposium. I think that the continual sharing of ideas and each person pushing the other to ask and demand for better outcomes is the most important thing we can do for each other. But specifically in this space, where the practices are as old as the ceiling in this room, you have to demand a modern, thoughtful approach. The same way that you approach your loved ones and your patients in a modern, thoughtful way, your estate planning should be as modern, as thoughtful, as flexible as you are. Um, and I know that when you do that, we have amazing outcomes. So if I can be of help to anybody, please feel free to reach out to me, um, but of course, if you already have these things in place, don't be afraid to ask questions and to really demand to understand, would this work in an emergency? You know, Is this something that my child can feel good about? Is it something that's punitive? If you read your trust, you'll probably find punitive language in there about what happens when a person doesn't behave. And if that's the case, you're headed down a path of certain litigation. So I'm really happy to be here and thank you for having me.